project of this size, we need uh, a lot of people uh, to be successful, but probably none more than the people that keep the detector running. So that's what we're gonna do is hear from those that did this last year. So without further ado, Martin and Josh. Thank you very much, uh, Jim. Uh, yeah, so I can, uh, so Josh and me are going to talk about uh, our experience at South Pole. Uh, but, but where's Josh actually? Uh, can anybody see body? I don't know. Where is he? But don't worry. Uh, at South Pole, we have a paging system. And whenever the detector goes wrong, uh, there's a page. And I'm just going to make a page, and, and he should come up, right? Hey, Martin, what's wrong? Is the detector okay? Everything is fine. It's just the window of a talk. <laughs> All right. Uh, yes, so as I said, we uh, would like to give you uh, uh, the talk, basically, what, uh, what we did uh, last year, one year at the South Pole. 13 months, actually. Yeah, 13 months below zero. And uh, this was actually the year when when there was a uh, pandemic. And so we basically were hiding there and we were isolated there the whole time. And uh, we had a great time there. Yeah. So we'll, um, we'll start by talking a bit about um, the South Pole and the science. Why are we actually going to Pole? Um, so South Pole is literally the South Pole to the very bottom of the Earth, depending on where you think the bottom is. Um, and this aerial photo shows uh, the station. Um, so this is the station here. Um, this is quite an old picture and actually the the instruments like the experiments are kind of the dark sector is here. So ice cube is just off the right hand side of the screen. Um, and the largest experiments at pole are ice cube. Um, there are three um, radio telescopes which are interested in um, so sort of the formation of the, the universe. Um, and NOAA um, has an atmospheric observatory which is somewhere around here. I think. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so there's also lots of like, a very wide variety of science happens at South Pole. Um, everything from like, very fundamental physics to um, climate science, which is very relevant for today. Yeah, uh, but with ice cube, basically we're doing uh, astronomy, and uh, uh, so classical astronomy uses uh, photons and light. Uh, uh, to detect uh, objects uh, in the universe and to observe to and and to observe these objects, and so the the light is, uh, consists of uh, uh, can, well, light is photons, and the photons can have different energies, uh, and so they also have different so-called wavelengths, and uh, and so the energy of the light can be quite. Uh, 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 can be like a di quite quite different. So. Um, and so we have basically, uh, when we basically look uh, with optical telescopes, like we have here, for example, on La Palma, uh, then we're basically looking at this optical light, uh, which is only a very small portion of that uh, wide range of, uh, of uh, uh, energies. Um, but then when we go to higher energies and smaller wavelengths, uh, we can actually also uh, 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 observe like objects in, for example, in, in the, in the X-ray, uh, a band also, and also when we go to higher energies in, in gamma rays, and then we go for even higher energies, we go in, in cosmic rays. And this is basically here an example of the Grab Nebula uh, observed in, in different wavelengths. And that, so the object actually looks quite different. And so with Ice Cube, we can actually, uh, we're not using photons, but we're using so called neutrinos, which are elementary particles, and they're interacting only very weakly. And uh, and these uh, neutrinos, uh, they can be produced uh, when, for example, protons are colliding uh, with, with each other. And uh, there might be objects in the universe which actually uh, produce very high energy protons, and then these protons collide and then produce uh, 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 other particles uh, and also neutrinos. And then these neutrinos, they come, can come to Earth and uh, and uh, 
because they don't interact with anything else, they will actually point back to where they actually come from. And so on Earth, we can then detect with a big neutrino detector these, uh, these neutrinos, and uh, we can do a neutrino astronomy with that. And uh, uh, so at South Pole, we then basically built a large, uh, well, Ice Cube has built a very large uh, uh, neutrino detector. And so we're actually using the, 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 uh, the ice as, an, as, an, um, uh, as, a, as a detection medium. So whenever a neutrino comes in uh, uh, to the, uh, 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 into the ice and it interacts in the ice, then it produces other particles, uh, charged particles. And uh, these charged particles travel faster than the speed of light in the ice, then they produce uh, shrink of photons. And, uh, and so we have many different optical modules in the eyes to detect these, these, these rank of photons. And then uh, with, the, with the time and, and the amount of light that we detect, we can reconstruct the direction of these neutrinos. And so we have uh, 86 uh, holes uh, drilled into uh, the, the eyes at the South Pole. And on each, in each hole, we have put a cable inside. And there are 60 digital optical modules on these cables. And so in total, we have more than, uh, yeah, we have uh, 5,160 uh, DOMs there. And, uh, and then in all these cables, they can go up to the surface and they are collecting at the so-called ice cube lab at the ICL. It's, it's a building in the center of, uh, of the detector. And that's where basically all our computers are located, where we collect all the data and whenever things go wrong and hardware breaks, we wouldn't always have to go out there and replace uh, uh, hardware. Uh, make sure that the ice cube is, uh, uh, is working properly and we collect, uh, we collect all the data, all the, all, the, all, all the neutrinos. So this is uh, what I basically already uh, uh, explained to you a little bit, uh, how basically uh, uh, ice cube detects these neutrinos. So this is basically uh, shows like a, a typical uh, ice cube event. So you have the neutrino coming in, uh, it produces a charged uh, particle, in this case, the so-called muon, and this travels through uh, the, uh, the ice, produces shrink of light, and we, we detect this. And these bubbles here, basically, they kind of, uh, uh, the, the size basically is, tells you how much light was detected, and the color kind of tells you at what, at what time it was detected. And so that the particle, the muon, travels through, and we detect uh, uh, the light, and then we can reconstruct the direction and also the energy of uh, this, this muon, and basically then also the, the energy and direction of the neutrino. And so this is how we can do neutrino astronomy. So we have basically have a, have an, a, a telescope, a neutrino telescope uh, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the South Pole. And of course, uh, such a big experiment can only be uh, done with many people working together and so the ice collaboration actually consists of very many different uh, institutions all over the world. Uh, uh, most of them are actually here in the US and then the other part, uh, the other half basically is mostly in, in Europe. We have some collaborators uh, also in Australia and in New Zealand. And uh, so, yeah, so it's really an, an, a great experience to work in ice cube. Uh, many different national uh, people are working together. It's, uh, it's really great. So, and then with IceCube, we can do very many different uh, science topics, actually, because IceCube is a very multi-purpose detector. And so, uh, so this basically, this, this, this figure basically shows you all the different things we can do with, with IceCube. IceCube was uh, actually uh, built in order to do, like, uh, the main goal was to, to do uh, astrophysics to detect these high-energy neutrinos. Um, people uh, or theorists, they were... Uh, predicting, yeah, there must be objects in the universe that are producing these high energy neutrinos. And, uh, and so IceCube was built to detect those. But then we, over time, we also figured out that we can actually do many different sciences. Uh, for example, we could uh, study the ice at the South Pole, for example, or we could uh, figure out uh, what, uh, what Earth is actually made of. Uh, and, uh, and also, what's also part of my PhD thesis that I did a few years ago, I was looking at dark matter, or, or at least I was trying to find dark matter. I didn't succeed. <laughs> uh, probably because it's very dark and it's very 
difficult to find. Um, and so, yeah, so, so Ice Cube is a really great experiment that you can really do very many different things. And so, so here I'm just gonna highlight this is just really just very the highlights of the highlights basically uh, that Ice Cube can do. Uh, so in 2013, uh, we have basically with Ice Cube uh, detected the first astrophysical muon neutrinos from the universe. And, uh, and this is what actually by Ice Cube was actually built for. And, uh, and, and so it was really great to, to see that these high energy neutrinos actually exist. And then in 2018, I was uh, actually, we had, we had a, a, a neutrino detected in 2017. And I was also at South Pole. Actually, this was my second year here uh, at South Pole. And in 2017, I was also there. And we detected this, this one high energy neutrino. And then uh, other experiments were looking in the direction where the neutrino came from. And they figured out, oh, uh, there is actually an object, a so-called placer. It's a galaxy with a black hole. And the black hole spits out a jet of particles. And this jet of particles is directed to Earth. And uh, and uh, so, so what we did in ASCII, we also looked at the data that we already collected in the past. And we saw that also a few years back, we had a, a lot of neutrinos coming from, from, this, from this direction. And so, so this was basically the evidence that we have actually the first neutrino source uh, detected with IceCube. So, so IceCube was really a great experiment. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the other part of this talk is obviously what you're here for, which is what do we do for a year? Um, and as the talk says, a year in isolation. So this is kind of a strange year to go down because the world is a lot more familiar with isolation than they would be normally. Um, and actually getting to pole was um, a lot more difficult than it would be. Um, but here are some facts about um, the pole that you may or may not know. Um, it's in Antarctica, which is the world's highest, um, driest, coldest um, continent. Um, it's a desert, so um, it's basically 0% humidity. Um, it's extremely cold, so um, it only really gets as warm as minus 15 Celsius, which is about zero Fahrenheit, um, and down to just over negative 100 Fahrenheit, which is minus 70, um, well, 100 is minus 72 Celsius. Um, the population uh, of our summer uh, was around 80, which is around half the capacity of the station. So um, we had a very reduced um, station population in the summer. Um, the winter population was around 40, which is pretty normal. Um, of course, Ice Cube only sent down two people this year, which is, um, you know, only us. Um, and it's an interesting place to live because you're there for a whole year. And because it's on the pole, um, one day lasts the whole time. So we have, um, you know, effectively, uh, you know, one day lasts a year. Um, we're in isolation for most of that. So eight and a half months, um, you can't leave. Um, we get all our power from uh, diesel, which is kind of shipped in over the summer. Uh, we have a big power plant on site, which powers the station. Um, internet is limited, to say the least. Um, we have a few hours of you know, usable internet every day, um, which is enough to email people and you can, you know, you can browse the web, but it's not great. Um, what people are worried a lot about, we get two two minute showers a week um, because water is a very scarce resource. Like it uses a lot of energy to, to melt water. Um, and as winter rovers, uh, we're on call 24 seven. So there's a joke that we have um, at the pole that science never sleeps um, because you know, we have effectively no holiday because if the detector pings us, um, we have to go and fix it. Um, and you know, if this happens at Christmas day, then that's, that's life. Um, and speaking of life, there is none. So um, people often ask us like, oh, did you see polar bears, which is the wrong hemisphere? Um, did you see you know, seals and penguins? And these exist in Antarctica, but not at the pole. Pole is, is basically a sterile, cold environment. Um, it's just too cold for anybody to live there. Yeah. So then of course, yeah, how do you actually travel to South Pole? Uh, well, uh, it is uh, complicated, especially during the pandemic. Uh, so we actually had to fly. So George came, 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 came from London and I came, 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 came from Munich. And so we actually had to fly to San Francisco um, uh, in order to catch uh, a charter flight uh, which was going to 
to to to Christchurch. Uh, actually, on the way, our plane had an engine failure, and we had to had to go to Auckland first, and then we switched planes and uh, went to to Christchurch. Um, but when we flew to to uh, San Francisco, we actually had to isolate there for two weeks uh, in, a, in a hotel there at the airport. It was a nice hotel. Um, had yeah. a nice uh, <laughs> nice menu that we could order. Had a nice cheesecake. Yep, two uh, weeks of cheesecake was pretty good. <laughs> And uh, 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 yeah, and then and then uh, and so so we actually started our journey uh, actually exactly two years ago. So today it's the twenty second of September. Two years ago we started. Uh, so then we arrived in San Francisco. Did two weeks of uh, isolation there. Uh, then uh, October uh, in October we met the other people basically there, or the other people also came to the to the hotel there, and then we flew uh, over to to to. to to New Zealand to Christchurch, and there we had to do two weeks of managed isolation. So, which means you go into a hotel room and you're staying there for two weeks. Uh, there were like three COVID tests uh, we had to take, yep. um, and then everything was clear. And then we could continue our journey uh, from Christchurch to the coast of Antarctica to the research station called McMurdo. Um, this is basically a big uh, lo uh, logistic hub where all uh, uh, of the uh, of the American stations are supplied here, and then we flew over uh, to uh, South Pole, but not that quickly because uh, the weather at South Pole was bad, and so we had to stay in McMurdo. We were actually stranded there for another month, so it took us two months and two days to fly from Europe to the South Pole. Just quite a long time. I mean, we had a month in McMurdo was. Um, kind of interesting because we got to do a lot of the touristy stuff that we would otherwise not be able to do because we had really nothing else to do for a month. So it was kind of a, it was a nice relaxing experience in a way because we had so much stress to getting visas for the US and worrying about if we're going to get COVID. And, you know, as soon as you get to Antarctica, it's kind of like, okay, relief, we're actually here. Um, so that was nice. Yeah. So when you arrive in, uh, in, uh, in Christchurch, then what you usually get, you go to the CDC, the Closing Distribution Center, and you pick up your so-called ECW, Extremely Cold Weather Gear. Uh, actually, last year, uh, it was different because we were in the hotel room, uh, isolated. Um, and so they actually brought these orange bags where, where your ECW is, is inside. They brought it to the hotel, and then we tried it on. And we and if something didn't fit, uh, didn't, didn't, didn't fit, then we would uh, um, uh, exchange it. Uh, but usually, in normal years, yeah, you go to the CDC and you and you get your stuff there. And of course, this is also the last time, and you have the last chance to see flowers and trees and green for a year. Not technically true, but there is a greenhouse. Yeah, there's a greenhouse. We will we'll we'll get tell to you later. So, and then you fly to McMurdo, and uh, the flight there uh, is kind of a comfortable flight. Uh, it's a it's a big airplane. Uh, so the U.S. Air Force, they are uh, flying uh, uh, the scientists or the, also the people uh, uh, from Christchurch to uh, McMurdo. Um, and uh, and then you basically end there, and then McMurdo is uh, is kind of a big, a big uh, yeah, kind of a big city actually. So so in normal non-COVID years, uh, during the summertime, there are over a thousand people living there or working there. And uh, uh, but I think uh, last year, the summertime, there were only like three hundred people there. Yeah, three or four hundred, I think. So it was really quiet, uh, which was nice. I like quiet. Um, and then you can. So there's a, there's a hill up there where you can go up and you have a nice, nice view. Um, and yeah, there's also the so-called Scott Hut, uh, where Scott was uh, 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 oh yeah, wintering over there, uh, like almost uh, yeah, over 100 years ago or so. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and then basically you, you continue. Oh, yeah, then of course, yeah, wildlife. Um, it's, yeah, it's actually wildlife in McMurdo. And uh, uh, this is a picture uh, I took. Uh, actually, my, 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 my first uh, trip to, to the South Pole, um, and I had to get a little chance to actually see all the wildlife in one image. So we have uh, seals. Seals are always there. They are just lying there doing nothing. You think they are dead because they're not moving at all, but occasionally they are moving a little bit. Um, and then there were pengu uh, there are peng pe penguins, and, uh, and this is... Uh, 
that you don't you don't see them too often. Uh, it's only to, to, when, when when the weather's a little bit warmer and the, the ice is a little bit melting. And then what you also have you have skuas. Uh, so these are like uh, uh, an Arctic bird, the uh, birds, and uh, and they also those you you see occasionally uh, there in McMurdo. But at South Pole there's no wildlife. What what whatsoever. Yeah, and so in order to get to um, South Pole from McMurdo, we take another plane. Um, and in a normal year, it would be one of these. Um, this is a, uh, an LC-130. It's another um, cargo aircraft. Um, it's kind of the workhorse of, of Antarctica. Um, but because we didn't really have enough pilots and support crew to sort of maintain and support these aircraft, we flew on um, one of these. And this is a Basler. Um, and this is kind of a actually quite a special experience because um, they fly this very small aircraft. It flies very low. Um, it's unpressurized, so it actually can't fly very high um, unless you have oxygen. Uh, and it has windows. So normally, when you fly in um, in the hook, as we call these things, um, it's you know it's a it's a military transport plane, and there are no windows on the sides really. So it's kind of cool that you can actually look out over the landscape as you fly to to Poland. On the way there, we flew very low, kind of through the mountains, um, which was uh, what you see on the sort of top right. So it's a really kind of stunning landscape. Um, the flight took takes something like four hours in a Basler, so a little bit longer than it would normally. Um, and then you land um, at Pole. So this is um, the sort of the entrance to the station um, where everyone comes in. Um, and you get inducted and told you know, where your room is and um, get ready to work. Yeah, so some facts about the South Pole station when you arrive there. Uh, the station uh, is elevated. Oh, 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 the station is very high in elevation uh, because if you, when you're flying there, uh, you actually go from sea level uh, to an uh, elevation of uh, 9,300 feet. Uh, so the first uh, few days are a little bit rough because there's less oxygen there. And uh, so it's about 30% less oxygen. Uh, and so you're breathing very heavily. And uh, uh, so you have to take it very slow when you arrive there. Um, the station is fairly large, so it's uh, about uh, 65,000 square feet. And uh, yeah, uh, during our last winter, uh, we were uh, 39 people on station. And, and, uh, and usually I get the question, you know, how, how do you uh, produce heat and electricity? So while well, we have uh, uh, generators uh, uh, at the South Pole and, uh, uh, and we are basically over a year about, about uh, burning about uh, uh, 450,000 gallons of, of, of fuel there. And this fuel actually have to come from the coast. So they're actually uh, tractors are uh, uh, pulling all the fuel from McMurdo to South Pole. So, so one journey from McMurdo to South Pole is about one month. So, so people are driving these tractors for months over Antarctica. It's, it's, it's really anyway, so we, mind boggling. I think the, so this is called Spot, the South Pole Overland Traverse. And, um, the first traverse left pretty much as soon as we arrived in McMurdo. And there's kind of a joke whether we would actually beat it there or not, um, given how long we were delayed. Um, and I guess to so the bottom right, um, this is my bedroom at Paul. Um, people make some effort to kind of make their rooms look nice because that's your home for a year and you kind of want to feel at home. So people bring posters. Um, I ask people to send me postcards, um, which I put up on the wall. Um, yeah, so people get kind of creative with making this place feel at home. Um, otherwise, yeah, this is our, our galley where we eat and it's a, a big social space. Um, and this is like the main corridor down the station. So um, if you remember from the other picture, station is basically like a big, it's like one long hallway with wings coming off it. And that's sort of the view down the, yeah, down the main hallway. So inside the station, uh, there are actually quite some some, some facilities we have there. Uh, so we have a, a, a very big uh, a gym there. Uh, where we can play dodgeball or <laughs> other things, or uh, uh, badminton or volley volleyball. It's a very, uh, 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 very a sport that many many people are playing there. Uh, there's also a library where you can we can read uh, books, and there are many many different books. And everyone who comes there usually brings a book, and then usually leaves. Uh, they, they, they actually leave the, the books there. Um, as I said, we have uh, generators uh, at South Pole uh, to uh, uh, produce heat uh, and uh, electricity. Uh, we have a sauna there, so if you get uh, very cold during the winter time, uh, you can heat up there. So that's really, really nice. Um, and then we have a so-called dish pit. So uh, when you have when you eat there, of course there are 
also uh, uh, plates that, that have to be washed and cleaned. And uh, everyone on, stage, on, on South Pole Station uh, has, to, has, has to help out this dish pit. Um, and uh, so, yeah. Yeah, so we had a rotation for dish pit um, in the winter. So everyone, it was like once a month, maybe we had to do it. Or? Yeah. So, yeah, so people would actually team up. So uh, Josh and I, we were uh, a team and teaming up. And, uh, and so, um, uh, so we, we made the most out of our time for in dish yeah. pit. <laughs> Yeah, so we have um, lots of opportunities for entertainment. Uh, there are two movie lounges, so we have two here. There's a music room, which is very well stocked. Um, there's also a piano in the library. Uh, we have um, a pool table, we have darts, um, even more books. Um, and this is a slightly better view of the gym, um, the sort of big gym where we watch movies and other things. Um, and I think people are playing, probably playing volleyball, actually. Um, yeah, there's also a, a smaller gym uh, from where the picture is actually taken, and there you have uh, you can uh, lift weights and and have the go go running, um, which we cannot talk more about this. Uh, as we said, we also have a greenhouse at the South Pole because when you are uh, 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 living there during the winter time, and there are actually no flights coming in and out during the winter time, so between uh, February and uh, and yeah late October, beginning of November, there are no flights there, you are really isolated by yourself. Uh, then in order to get fresh food, basically, uh, the only way is to grow uh, some fresh fruit. And um, uh, so we had uh, usually a salads there. Uh, we had some various small strawberries, uh, lots of tomatoes. Yeah, so this, um, this big bush in the middle is a tomato plant. And this thing was kind of, it went a bit nuts, you kind of trim like, bags and bags of leaves off and it would grow back the next day. So we had, yeah, I think we had enough salad to have a, like a, um, a bowl of salad for pretty much every day we were there. So um, it was pretty good. I mean, it's, and it's obviously it's about as fresh as you can get. So it's kind of funny when people say they go back to New Zealand and say like, oh, I really want like fresh lettuce. Like, well, we have, we have this stuff. It's really nice. Uh, we grew flowers as well. Uh, there's some rule about it has to be edible. So these are edible flowers. Um, the chefs use them for kind of fancy desserts, which is nice. Um, I think these are some kind of um, cucumber, maybe. But yeah. Yeah, we had some cucumbers uh, and some peppers as well. Yeah. So uh, one tradition at South Pole is so the thing is the ice at the South Pole it moves, and so every year it moves about ten meters or thirty feet, and uh, and so there is a so-called South Pole marker at South Pole, so to indicate where the actually South Pole is. And because the ice is moving, then this marker also moves. And so every year, this marker has to be moved as well. And so there's a tradition that uh, the winter overs each year, they design a new South Pole marker. And, uh, and on January 1st, each year, then this marker is moved and it's replaced with the new marker that was designed by the winter overs the year before. Yeah, this is this is Brandon, who is winter over for, for bicep. Um, so he designed uh, and made the marker. And it was kind of, a, again, a special year because he was there long enough that he actually got to install it uh, in the following January, um, which is kind of nice for him. Yeah, because usually people leave like in, in uh, November or, or, or December, and uh, so they can't really install their own markers. Uh, but Brandon, it was a special year. So Brandon actually stayed until like uh, the end of uh, 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 January and then was able to actually install it himself. And this is a picture uh, uh, from January 1st where uh, the, 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 the marker sign was, was, was moved to so all the, the sign. So you actually you dig out the, the, the sign, the geographic South Pole sign and you move it over and then also the marker. It's a big uh, celebration there. Yeah, and obviously- so, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so over the course of the year, there are a lot of different festivities, some of which are familiar to um, the world and some of which are maybe not. Um, so we celebrate Thanksgiving, we celebrate Christmas, um, New Year, as Martin said, the, the new pole marker. Um, and these are usually, you know, marked by um, a big meal. So the, the galley puts on, you know, a kind of silver service thing with um, you know, many courses and it's, um, you yeah, know, the food is usually... The food is actually very good in our year. So I should point out that people think that the food is going to be you know, not great at the South Pole. We had a team of really good chefs and we ate very well for the whole year. So this was like kind of even beyond what they would normally make. Yeah, we had a baker there. He was doing really great cakes and uh, 
Uh, we had to run extra miles uh, yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to get these calories off of us. And then these are some celebrations that you, you might not um, necessarily celebrate all the time. So we celebrate sunset, um, which is a big deal. We celebrate midwinter um, and we celebrate sunrise. And again, all these events we mark with usually a, a banquet kind of event. Exactly. So the food is really great there, um, especially uh, last year when it was really, really great. So, and then also fun things to do. Uh, there's a climbing uh, uh, gym at the South Pole. So I was trying out to do some, some climbing, some bouldering there. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I'm not that, that great at bouldering. Um, then there's something, there's a, a, a kind of a, a, a tradition that we at South Pole that uh, we run to Mordor. So basically we watch all the the, 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 what's the three uh, uh, Lord of the Ring yeah. movies? The extended editions. So it's like a 10 hour event or something, I think, or maybe longer actually. I think, it's 11 I think hours. it was like 11 hours or so. And, uh, and so for 11 hours, you're going to run. I mean, so either you're being on, 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 on the treadmill or, or on, on, on a static bike or so. And uh, yeah. And then you, you make run your own entertainment. <laughs> Uh, what you can also do, you can do like snow angels in the snow, as one would do. Uh, sometimes we also do a little bit of uh, uh, outreach. Uh, so this was an event we were asked uh, to take some pictures of us reading at the South Pole to actually encourage uh, young people and students to read more. And uh, so, yeah, so, so we did a nice uh, uh, picture here lying at the South Pole and uh, reading some books. And so, yeah, that was great. And then, uh, and then there's also the so-called race around the world every year. Uh, it's about about Christmas time, on about, and uh, and so race around the world basically means there's like a like a two mile uh, trek around the geographic South Pole, and if you go around the geographic South Pole, then of course you're traveled around the world, and uh, and so this is very fun, a very fun thing to do, and uh, so so it's very. Yeah. I mean, this is an interesting story because this was, it was a, the day after Christmas, so the 26th, um, and we weren't able to participate this year because we had a page. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, you can get paged at kind of random times. And that morning uh, we had a DOM, actually a DOM failed that day. Um, and, you know, two of us and John Harden were out um, at ICL trying to troubleshoot and fix things while everyone else was, <laughs> was running around the world. Um, we, we, we turned them a little bit later then, yeah. Yeah. It was, it was still great. So at some point then, uh, the, the summer is over, uh, usually then in February, uh, the station closes. Uh, that means the last airplane is gonna leave. And, uh, and this is actually a picture uh, taken on February 17th, so it's uh, the last plane leaving the station. And there's another tradition at South Pole, when the last plane leaves, uh, you're gonna watch the thing from another world. And uh, actually three movies, and you want to watch all of these three movies, of course. And uh, yeah, uh, if you haven't seen that, uh, it's about basically an alien at the uh, Antarctica. At Antarctica. <laughs> and then sun will set in March. And uh, if you're lucky or unlucky, it's going to look like this. Because if you have a lot of wind, if a snowstorm, uh, you won't see much. But uh, this was actually a taking picture one day before actually sunset. Uh, I mean, sunset takes, it, it goes for a long time. So the sun goes gradually, goes down uh, over several weeks because there's only one sunset a year and only some sun, sunrise a year. And so you have a lot of time to actually see the sun setting. Um, uh, but yeah, but actually, of course, there is an actual sunset, an astronomical sunset, and yeah, and in the sunset time, uh, you get really nice pictures, nice lighting, uh, it looks really, really great there. And then if you're lucky, uh, when the weather is nice at the sunset, uh, you can see the so-called green flash. Uh, and this, and basically when the sun goes down, and then through the, uh, the, the atmosphere, the sunlight actually gets uh, reflected. And uh, it's basically the, the sun, uh, the, the light gets split up into its different wavelengths. And uh, you see a green, so-called green flash. 
And uh, that's why you can also see this here, uh, over, for example, over the, the, the ocean when the sun goes down. But because the sun goes down here so much faster, this is really a flash. So it's like, a, like a, a fraction of a second when you can see this. But the South Pole, because the sun goes down so very slowly, this will actually last for several minutes. So, so you actually watch out for, for, these, uh, for this green flash and, uh, and we were able to see it. We were lucky again uh, and, uh, and take a picture of this. So it's always a big event. Everyone is uh, standing in the galley at the window and watching out for it and see. So it's uh, also kind of a nice party there. And of course, the reason that um, we all go down is for the auroras. Um, so we have the Aurora Australis um, in the south as opposed to the Aurora Borealis in the north. Um, and yeah, as soon as the sun goes down, um, you can see these sort of amazing light shows um, over the station. And um, they can be incredibly bright, like to the point where you can, you can walk around outside and you can see, you know, um, you, you can kind of walk without needing a head torch or anything. Yeah. One day I was working uh, from station to the ice cube lab because some, something was broken at, 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 at the detector and to fix it. And I was walking, I was slowing down because the, you have a lot of uh, sastrugi, so the, the, the snow is very, very uh, uh, hilly and not to trip over. You have to look down and suddenly it was coming really bright, everything, and everywhere green. And it was the thing, and what, what was going on here? And then I looked up and it was all the sky was full green, was auroras everywhere. And uh, it was really, really great. It was a really nice, nice, nice view. Yeah, I mean, so just a, a note, this is, um, this is Arrow, this is the Atmospheric Research Observatory. So this is NOAA's um, station. Um, and this green laser is, a, is an atmospheric LIDAR. So they, they send up a laser beam um, into the sky. Um, it reflects back to the station um, and they look at properties of the, the atmosphere. Um, and you can get some cool pictures if you take a picture of it uh, in the dark. Yeah, and then during the night sky, of course, you see the stars, so the Milky Way, uh, especially here, for example. Uh, because you are at the South Pole, uh, the stars just go around and around, so there, there are no stars setting or going going, going up. Um, and uh, and so yeah, uh, so basically the, the the Milky Way basically just rotates around the station. Um, so yeah, uh, it really it's really nice. Of course, it's also very cold. So then you would think, or you would probably ask, uh, yeah, what do you do as an ice cube window over there? What, what is your actually your work there? And uh, yeah, so basically our main task is uh, to monitor and to maintain the ice cube detector so that this door is taking data, whenever, whenever things break, we're gonna try to fix it. And, uh, and yeah, so, so here we have a couple of pictures. Uh, so this is Josh. Uh, 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 I think we're placing like like a like a, a door card or something like that. So, so yeah, and then uh, uh, me like uh, uh, we're placing some some hard drives uh, because we also so we are collecting all the data and it has to be uh, backed up and uh, and so we're filling up uh, hard drives uh, terabytes of data basically. And, uh, and so from time to time, like every week or so, these hard drives have to get full. And, uh, and then we replace them with, with empty hard drives and then the full hard drives that they get shipped out during the summertime then we are, we are, we are airplanes. And uh, yeah, and you can also do like, or well, you can help basically do better observations. So I don't know if you want to explain this. Bit. Yeah, so um, we do, well, the, the station takes um, daily weather observations uh, with balloons. So this is, the thing on the end of this is, a, is called a, um, a radio, so it's just a sonde, right? Um, so it's basically a little sensor package and a big helium balloon, um, and it goes up into the atmosphere. And these are launched um, pretty much daily, so we can um, monitor the weather on the pole. And it's a fun thing that you know you can ask the weather guys, "Can I, can I launch a balloon?" And you go in and do it. It's it's fun. Um, this is uh, a telescope that's normally on the roof of ICL, um, which there's another picture in the, the next slide. Um, this is a um, an Ayer-Cherenkov telescope, so it functions in a similar way to ice cube, except air is the, the detection medium instead of ice. Um, and this telescope, because it's, um, you know, it's, it's pointed at the sky, uh, we can only open the, it during winter. So one of our jobs is to take the cover off um, in spring and put it back on um, at the end of the winter. Uh, yes, the end of winter. Um, and we were doing some maintenance uh, on this um, when John was still here. Um, yeah, go to the next one. And yeah, this is the same telescope on the roof. So this is, um, I think, taking the lid off 
and when the sky is dark enough that we don't um, you know, damage the, uh, the sensor. Uh, this is actually an, they say not, not the sun as you would expect, uh, it's the moon. Uh, the moon can be very bright uh, as well. So. Yeah, um, so we do work outside. Uh, people often ask me, like, do, we, do you ever leave the station? <laughs> I mean, for, for one thing, the ICL is, is about a kilometer away, so we have to walk there. Um, but there are some things which we do routinely. So we, um, we measure snow accumulation on top of, of ice cube. So we, a few times a year, we, we go out to um, every, the top of every string and we measure how much snow has fallen since the last time we measured it. Um, and this is me, uh, this, this is actually a string marker. So below here is, is one of the strings. Um, and we're just measuring the exposed height of the pole. Um, and so we have to do this for you know, all the strings. Um, if the poles are, you know, getting buried, we extend them and, and so on. Um, and this is like a, a one or two day job. It's, it's not a, a small task. Um, yeah, because you have to basically you have to drive to, to, uh, to, the every, to, to every station, to every, every, every one of the, of the 86 station, station basically, and they have to, to measure these and there are two, two poles you have to measure for, for each station. So yeah, so this is a bit of a work. Uh, and yeah. uh, you have to do this like uh, three or four times in a year. So, so that's a little bit of a work. Uh, we also have uh, uh, so-called scintillator detectors, so they are also measuring like uh, like muons coming from from the sky, and so and so sometimes we we have to go out there see how these are doing or take some pictures of it uh, so that the uh, that uh, the scientists in the north can actually look how how this is doing and so so yeah. Yeah, um, and so everyone at Pole is on um, an emergency response team because. Um, there just aren't enough people to, to have a dedicated team to do this. Uh, we have, well, we have a doctor and a, an assistant, so we do have dedicated medical staff. But um, you know, the, the fire brigade is voluntary. Um, there's also a voluntary medical team, um, and everyone is is organised into these different groups. So we have um, first response, uh, fire, logistics, medical, and tech rescue. Um, so I was on the fire brigade, and you can see us um, training here. So. Probably what we're doing is practicing getting um, our gear on. So we do these drills to try and get dressed as quickly as possible. Um, so in under two minutes. Um, and we would train every week. So every um, once a week, we'd have some scenario. We try and put out a, an imaginary fire, or we'd practice um, different things that could go wrong on station. Um, Martin was on medical. Yeah. So this is a picture of uh, of us uh, doing medical. Uh, 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 we were le learning uh, uh, how to stitch up basically uh, skin, um, um, and so yeah. Uh, so our uh, two doctors uh, here in the back, uh, uh, they were quite great and uh, helped us uh, uh, to to learn how how we would uh, do in a med medical emergency basically. Uh, so that basically the, the medical ERT team is then responsible to basically help the doctors. Uh, uh, to, to assist the doctors, basically, uh, in case there's a medical emergency. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so we, we try and stay in shape. Um, as you saw, like, South Pole has a couple of gyms or places you can, you can work out. And as Martin said, we had a really good baker who did his best to undo all the hard work. Um, one of the big events in the winter is the South Pole Marathon. So it's a, a full-length marathon um, uh, at Pole, actually, in the summer, sorry. And this is people running it. I think the best time was Brandon who made the pole marker and he ran it in something like four hours because he's crazy. Um, in the winter, we have this thing called the Triple Crown, which um, is kind of a fun series of events. We try and uh, run the distance of McMoto over the course of the winter, around 840 miles. Um, we have this thing called uh, the beer can. So there's a, a tower that is um, kind of attached to the side of the station that lets you access the underground um, storage areas. And we try to run up and down that um, enough times that we've ascended Everest um, and lift the weight of the cargo and some of the fuel that came to station. So doing weights or um, however you do it. Um, so yeah, yeah we, we kept busy. And Josh and I we were actually doing also so-called uh, 10K runs uh, from time to time. And uh, we had a movie uh, showing a train ride in, in, in Norway, uh, going from Oslo to, 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 to Bodo or so. And uh, so basically, it's basically show, it's just like a movie. It's like a, in, in like a 10 hour movie or so. It's just <laughs> with the train going the tracks there. And so, uh, so we were saying that yeah, while we are running, we are also running through Norway basically. <laughs> So that was also fun, fun to do. Yeah, and then uh, of course, in order to stay busy, uh, uh, everyone has its own like uh, personal projects uh, uh, that one 
could do. And uh, I think you are trying to uh, build like a sunrise clock, right? Yeah, one of the projects was building a you know clock that mimics the mimics sunlight, um, which I did not finish. It became first it became a sunrise clock, then a clock that would be ready by sunrise, and then I think I just gave up. But um, <laughs> there's always too much to do at Pole. People think that we are kind of bored and yeah, but actually you wonder where the time goes. Um, you never have enough time to do projects that you think you do. And one thing that uh, 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 that that also keeps you away from doing your personal projects is basically uh, so-called Olympics games. Uh, uh, so this is what uh, actually kind of every it's also the tradition now that uh, every year uh, people on station they do like uh, different games and so and uh, uh, and then uh, also uh, making medals then and then yeah uh, so um, yeah so that uh, keeps us busy and uh, in shape. Yeah, and then the winter comes to an end at some point, and the sun comes back. And, uh, and this is our pictures from the sunrise. And, uh, and so, and then we're basically, so sun rises in September, mid of September. Uh, and so, um, yeah, and then we're basically celebrating the sunrise. We have a dinner, then the, the, the sunrise dinner. And uh, yeah, so and then, the sun is up then but then you still have to wait like uh, two more months until the first plane comes come, comes in then because the first plane comes in end of uh, october <laughs> yeah there's also the so-called yeah i mean the, the winter over hall of fame so in the big hallway at south pole station uh at the wall they are basically uh from every year of every winter over a year uh there are pictures uh, of the winter over crew and uh, so every year, the winter over crew makes, makes a picture. They decide, they look, okay, what kind of picture we're gonna make. Usually it's a very, very special picture then. And uh, so this is basically uh, uh, a picture of all the, the previous winter windows. Uh, uh, this was, uh, yeah, the first picture, uh, first, the first window was there in 1956. And, uh, and of course, uh, we also did uh, uh, a winter over picture. Uh, uh, and uh, so these are actually, so, so Josh and Matt and Danielle, they actually, uh, they, they took the picture and then also they 3D printed uh, the frame for the picture. We actually have a 3D printer at House Pole. Yeah, so this took about, I think this is what we spent most of, <laughs> most of September doing was making this frame. And um, this is a, this is kind of a coin that somebody made, actually Brandon, the guy who made the pole marker, made this nice kind of medallion that we all got at midwinter. Um, this is Matt's picture. This was, Midwinter, I guess. Yeah, midwinter. Yeah. Um, yeah, we 3D printed this frame, um, and it's now hanging on the wall. So it's kind of a nice thing to leave behind. Yeah, and then we have another. Yeah, so this is the the picture that we took outside. Uh, this was uh, taken September twenty seventh, and uh, it was very cold there. Uh, I looked at uh, this called uh, Ice Cube Life System. So, uh, uh, so the Ice Cube. Uh, operations uh, website has also a, a chart basically what the total temperature at South Pole is. So, and I looked it up, and uh, at that day it was minus 70 Celsius or minus 94 Fahrenheit. Yeah, so it was really cold. Yeah, I mean, so this is quite a nice picture because you can see the, the big experiments at Pole. So, we have um, Ice Cube here on the right in the background. Um, the, the big dish in the front is the South Pole Telescope. Um, and then we have, um, I also get which is bicep through a bicep array. But these are the two bicep telescopes. Um, and so we all kind of met up in SPT at the South Telescope and, you know, ran outside, took the picture, ran back in, um, tried not to get too cold. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, yeah we were uh, warming up here in the so-called DSL, uh, the dark sector lab building, and then uh, uh, moving out here and then taking the picture. And, uh, yeah, the photographer meant got really, really cold. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then there's also uh, something that uh, this is so-called the ceremonial flag ruffle. Uh, so this is so this is shows the picture of the ceremonial pole. Um, so when the Antarctic Treaty was signed, it was uh, signed by 12 uh, countries, and uh, and so there are the flags of all these 12 countries there. And uh, and of course over the year, over, over, yeah, over the winter time, these flags will worn out because the wind blows and so. And so what we do, we, of course, we have to replace these flags. And what we do with the old flags, well, the winter overs, uh, they get these flags. And uh, so there's a revel at, at, at South Pole, who's gonna get uh, these flags? Uh, because I mean, there are 12 flags and uh, there are 40 people on station. 
and uh, and we got actually we two we got very lucky. Um, um, so so I uh, uh, got this uh, I got, got the American flag, uh, which was was very proud of, and uh, and then Josh got the British flag. Uh, yeah, I mean, you can see here, this is um, this is not the flag kind of holding. This is actually the damage to the flag that's caused over the years. So um, there's kind of a whole chunk of it that's just got blown away across the continent. Um, the wind is very, is very harsh. Yeah, and then, of course, there's the time coming to leave South Pole. Uh, so now we are, I think then we left like end of November. Uh, and uh, yeah, they're basically saying goodbye to the friends. Uh, and uh, you bought the plane. Uh, this is a picture from inside the Basler. Uh, There's a small Basler plane here. And, uh, and then, of course, you have yeah, flying in a Basler. As just said, there are windows. You can look outside, and you have really nice uh, views over uh, Antarctica. And actually, that day, we actually flew in a straight line uh, to McMurdo. And it, uh, instead of like taking five hours, it took us only three hours, the flight. Yes, yeah, so we, we had to use uh, oxygen cannulas, so we flew I think it's like over 10,000 feet for that. Yeah, we flew very high. Yeah. Um, but because we're not flying through the mountains, it was just a straight shot. Um, and this is uh, Observation Hill in uh, McMurdo. So this is the kind of the local mountain you can climb. Um, there's a, a cross on top. Um, the cross is actually maintained by the Kiwis. So the, the New Zealand base is kind of down the other side of the hill. Um, and they maintain the cross. We met the carpenter on our way in. Um, and yeah, it was a nice kind of couple of days before we went back to um, civilization. Yeah, so if you want to know more about Ice Cube, uh, so here uh, put together some links. Uh, so uh, you can, of course you can every every week or so, uh, the, the, the Ice Cube window overs were at the South Pole, they're writing a weekly report. And uh, you can see this uh, uh, on the Ice Cube uh, website. Uh, of course, uh, Ice Cube is also present on social media, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, I personally have also a, a Flickr page where I uh, put like South Pole pictures on, on it. And, uh, and yeah, you can also, of course, learn more uh, about the science that uh, Ice Cube is doing. I think we probably have time for questions if anyone has any. Um... Also, yeah. if, you, if you're interested in applying to be a winter rover, applications open up um, in a few months. Um, I suggest check Twitter because that's where um, I found out. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And yeah, any questions? Yeah, thank you very much. All right. <laughs> That was fantastic. Uh, thanks, thanks again. And um, you know, they they kind of underplayed this, but uh, the effort to get to the South Pole uh, was really extreme uh, this last year. And then um, there was an additional challenge in that uh, typically we would send at least one more person down to uh, do a few months of training. And so uh, we really appreciate Martin stepping up. And um, also John Harden stayed longer in order to help with that transition. But having Martin, who had been there before, was, was uh, really critical. So thank you so much. OK, any questions? I, uh, I have a curiosity. Um, for uh, the people that brings the fuel uh, during one month with the tractors, I always wondered where do they actually sleep during that month? <laughs> where, where do they live? Because of the, the uh, they have like a, a cabin, I guess, that gets pulled long. So they have like, um, yeah, a whole bunch. There's, there's train of tractors, right? And then they carry these big fuel bladders. But they also have kind of, these trailers where they can have a kitchen and they have a bathroom and they have a place to sleep. I don't know, I mean, you visited Daniel, did they, did they hot bunk or did they, no, so I guess they had, their, they had their own bed, I guess, but um, yeah, so they, yeah, they kind of stop every day and we get an update where the, where the traverse is and what they had for breakfast and stuff is, they're kind of crazy people. Um, I have a question, um, I know it's, Really rare to get an opportunity to winter over. There's probably no one else in this room that's done that. Is there? 
wintered over, would you stand up? <laughs> well, this is how crazy it is to work in this project, right? You know, so <laughs> chances of somebody spending uh, 13 months at the South Pole are, are uh, extremely remote. So thank you all. I think it's about 1,500 people or so over the course of history. Yeah, I think uh, currently uh, there's about yeah, 1,500 people who have been uh, uh, over at the South Pole. Uh, there's actually somebody who's actually uh, keeping track of that uh, so spreadsheet, and, uh, uh, and everyone who windows over there has a has a window over number. <laughs> oh, yeah. A very fun talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I had a question about kind of the work week uh, at the South Pole. Do you do you work uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. during the week, or? Does uh, the ice cube detector just pretty much run itself and you just have to deal with uh, any issues that come up? Probably variable. Yeah, so uh, the ice cube detector works uh, really, really smoothly, really, really great. Uh, it uh, has like an uptime of over uh, 90 uh, Eight percent, basically. So, um, uh, so we went over. I always say um, I'm always working and never working, <laughs> and uh, uh, because you have to be on call. Uh, and uh, and so actually, our usually the, on South Pole, the the, the, the workday or when you sleep, your sleep cycle actually actually evolves with the satellite times, um, because usually uh, the the internet is via satellite. And uh, it actually changes every day by 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 four minutes, and so naturally your sleep cycle also changes so four minutes every day, <laughs> more or less. And um, yeah, so yeah, you're, I mean, you're trying to be awake when the satellite is up and when you have internet. So I mean, the, practically we we went on call every like we swapped every week. So one of us was kind of a primary on call person, um, and if something happened and it needed more than you know if it was beyond one person's work to fix then we'd wake up the other person and, and do it um there are kind of scheduled activities we have to do so we you know we we swap the hard drives from the backup system um occasionally we do calibration runs which are scheduled by um by madison so yeah but the, the actual day-to-day -day timetable is mostly dictated by the internet and food i i have two questions actually one is ice cube related were you in Ice Cube when you decided to winter over? Were you already in the collaboration? And my second question: What are the other, you know, daily common tasks besides the scientific one, like washing the dishes? What are your other responsibilities as winter over? Do you have like a common cleaning task? As like you, you, you do have a chef, but what are uh, about the other kind of maintenance that you have to do? Yeah, I mean, so I was not part of the collaboration. Um, Martin was, or still is. Um, in terms of other tasks, so yeah, we had um, we also had a weekly cleaning rotor, which we called House Mouse. So um, every week we would have something in the station to clean, like it might be the bathrooms, it might be sweeping the hallways. Um, and everyone does this because it's, it's a big station, and there's not enough people to do it. Um, yeah, we had dish pit. Um, we had obviously the emergency response team, so we, we did drills for that. Uh, we occasionally had kind of guests uh, we would cook for the station. So there was like a, a burger night or um, some, yeah, we gave the galley crew time off sometimes. So we, we cooked for the station. Um, what else did we? Yeah, sometimes we also have to help uh, bringing the food from downstairs to the kitchen, basically. Um, and um, so then, yeah. Yeah, really you just, you, you know, you know, these people, we, you work with the same 40 people for a year and it's often people say, hey, do you mind giving me a hand with this? Or you say, do you need help with something and you can you can help them out so it yeah. varies quite a lot yeah so so be scientists we usually try to help out uh, the other people on the station who are actually maintaining the, the station um and so whenever they need more help then we trying to to help them out that, that's one cool. last question how early in summer you have to be there as a winter over so we arrived um i mean in november i guess but that would have normally been like early november uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So we uh, uh, we arrived uh, beginning of, of November, uh, 
Uh, no, actually, we are, the, the price was actually because we were uh, delayed in McMurdo for for months, basically. So we arrived very we late. We arrived like uh, the twenty fifth of November or something like that. Um, and uh, um, yeah, yeah. So kind of, I mean, I guess in terms of the summer season, we're fairly early. So there are um, some people arrive like very close to the station close, um, and they only work for the winter. Some people do kind of a full summer and a winter, which is what we do pretty much. Yeah, so, so the ice cube and the they're always there for the whole year. So summer and winter time. Um, uh, but the other people are uh, uh, maintaining the station. So sometimes they, they just come for the winter or to only stay for, for the summertime. Uh, so that is very uh, difficult, oh, very different for, for every, everybody basically. Uh, but for ice cube, the ice cube and the always there for the whole, the whole year. Um, I mean, the, the station kind of crew change happens pretty early in the summer. So more or less, as soon as the station is open, um, you know, people want to leave. So um, the first flight takes out a lot of the, you know, the current crew when we take the summer crew arrives. So that, that kind of changeover happens quite, quite quickly at the start of the season. Yeah. Um, how hard is it getting from the station to the ICL in the dark? Do you just walk out with a flashlight and hope not to get stuck in the snow? Or do you have kind of a system there? Uh, I mean, so there's, there's a flag line. So um, there's a line of flags and we they have reflective markers on them. So you can you can see. Um, actually, it's, it's quite rare. Yeah, you can see the flags. Um, I mean, there are flags here. Uh, it's quite rare for it to be that dark um, because even in the winter, um, starlight is reasonably bright if it's a clear night. Um, if the moon's up, which it is, you know, half the time. Um, yeah, so often we wouldn't need head torches um, and because I, ICL is quite a, an easy place to get to. It's kind of, you know, you, it's a straight line and then you turn left. Um, you just follow the flags. Uh, it's a bit more difficult if you, you know, the, the UTs, the, the maintenance guys have to walk around the whole, you know, the whole sort of South Pole station. Um, and it's a bit more of a risk for them to get lost. But um, to get to ICL is pretty easy. And it also has a, there's a, a big red light on the side of the station, which is a kind of safety um, indicator. So you can also kind of orient with with that. How far is it from the station? How long do you take? Uh, uh, it's about a mile, uh, a little bit less than a mile, but uh, yeah. It's probably like 15, 20 minutes if you if you walk. Yeah, you, yeah usually it took us about uh, 20, 20 minutes, 25 minutes to, to walk there. Uh, it also depends on yeah, uh, how much wind there was before, how much, how, how big the uh, this, 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 Oh, great. So there's a question on, on Zoom that I'm that, that I'm reading on, on, mm -hmm. on behalf of the, the person po posting it and says, hi, I'm wondering how, how many women are, are usually at an ice cube so, South Pole station. I am curious because I, I couldn't see many in the pictures. So, uh, uh, um, I know, so last year we were uh, seven. like seven, seven, seven women on, on station. Uh, of the 39 people. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's always, uh, uh, we have less, less women on, on station, uh, uh, less, women on, less women than men on station, unfortunately. Um, but uh, I don't know, I mean, you should just basically apply and uh, I think uh, um, yeah, there, should not, there should not be any reason why, why you shouldn't go there, so. And certainly Ice Cube has had several um, female winter overs in the past, so. I think, I mean, science is a bit, is generally does better at diversity than um, kind of support on station. Um, I think we had, yeah, we were almost 50 50 within science. Yeah. Okay. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks again, Martin and Josh. And, uh,